She has nearly 20 years of experience, and until tomorrow, she was the public lands advocate for the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Historic Preservation at Denver Field Office. Tomorrow's her last day with the National Trust, and then in two weeks, she'll be taking a position with Paleo West. They're a consulting archaeology firm, right? Where they just do archaeology? Yeah, well, soon, soon be paleontology as well. Oh, there you go. So she'll be working for Paleo West, going back to her true love of archaeology and field work. Um, she earned her PhD in anthropology from the University of New Mexico in 2004. After graduation, Rebecca worked in cultural resource management for private firms in Maine, New Hampshire, New Mexico, and Colorado, managing, managing archaeological projects and leading excavations, so a true archaeologist, getting dirty, doing all the hard work. Um, we just got done talking about how people sometimes don't really know what real archaeology is all about, and it's, it's really a a tough profession, very rewarding profession, but it's not nearly as uh, Hollywood as people like to think it is. Uh, so for the past three and a half years, we've worked with the National Trust as a grassroots organizer and representative of in National Environmental Policy Act and National Historic Preservation Act issues. She builds relationships in, with diverse stakeholders to promote preservation of historic and cultural resources on federal public land. You talk about challenging jobs. <laughs> build relationships on federal public lands. Uh, and in the spring of 2010, Rebecca excavated her backyard outhouse in hopes that it would be a good way to get residents of Lafayette and the public excited about archaeology, historic preservation, and Lafayette's colorful local history. Through the excavation, Rebecca uncovered new items, new information about the inhabitants of her house and used that information to list the Richards House, which is the historic name of her house, on the Lafayette Register of Historic Places. So I think it's pretty impressive. That's a picture of the outhouse, right, up there? It is. Okay. It looks nicer now. I've actually painted it and <laughs> done a little bit of repairs, but that's what I really like about it. So with that, I'd like to give you to Rebecca. Thanks, and thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I love talking about this topic, so hopefully this will be a fun hour for you all, too. And I want to just be pretty informal, so if you have a question in the middle, just feel free to raise your hand or even yell out. It's, it's totally fine. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit, kind of just the very basic backgrounds of the project, and then just the very basics of what archaeologists do, kind of the, some of the stages that we go through, and then I'll give you more details of what I actually found in the outhouse. Okay, so Carol already said a little bit about this, but why did I excavate an outhouse? I mean, archaeologists, we try to not just go around excavating everything we see, of course, because that's kind of an unethical way to do archaeology. You destroy what you're looking at, so, but I had some specific reasons for why I wanted to excavate my, my office. And one was that I was working for the National Trust at the time, and I was really missing getting to do field work. I was missing getting to say I was an actual archaeologist. So I wanted to employ my professional skills in my backyard, which is an easy commute. Um, I also really want to turn my outhouse into a chicken coop, and so before I did that, I, before I got a lot of nasty stuff in there that I would have a hard time cleaning out, I wanted to see if there was anything intact underneath the floor. I was also in the process of applying to have my house put on the Lafayette Register of Historic Places, and one of the four criteria that the Historic Preservation Board uses to landmark properties in Lafayette is archaeological data potential. And I knew I'd qualify for the social kind of historical criterion, but I thought who better to apply for archaeological data potential than an archaeologist. Then finally, I thought this would be a great opportunity to help share not only information about Lafayette and my house's history with Lafayette, but also to talk about archaeology, the thing that I'm really passionate about, and hopefully educate people a little bit on why archaeological context is important, why archaeologists are actually skilled people who go to school and then work in their field, and not just anyone really can go out and dig in their yard and do the same kind of job that we can. So these were all these different reasons that I thought it would be good to excavate my outhouse. And before I go any further, I really want to emphasize context. I'm sure that you all are extremely responsible, but a lot of people would love to, you know, having heard this, go out and just dig a lot of holes in their backyards. And I want to stress the, the tremendous importance of archaeological context and why using archaeological methods, working with professional archaeologists, is really the best way to go. You learn by far more information than if you're just out poking around by yourselves. And this is a little example of, of what I mean by archaeological context and why that's important. So can anyone guess at what this is? A grommet off a tarp. A grommet off a what? Tarp. Tarp. Okay. Anyone else? What? Melted a button? Glass. Milk glass? Melted glass. Oh, melted glass. 
piece of jewelry or something? A piece of jewelry. Okay. Anything else? All right. So when we find this in context, and one of the guys who was helping me um, analyze the artifacts figured out what this was, it's actually the very the end there oops, of this syringe, the glass syringe. You see it fits on right there. So, um, boy, this one's far away. <laughs> it's up there. All right. So when you see this object in context, you see that it's just part of a typical Victorian household assemblage. And that's how you understand what this piece is. But if you had just been kind of digging willy-nilly, you would have absolutely no idea you'd be guessing until the cows came home and not really know what it was. Okay, so the location of my outhouse, you know, typically outhouses are located as far from the, the house as possible, usually on the alleys. And you can see this is, it's located in the northeast corner of my lot, um, back on the back right there with the blue door. My yard looks a lot different now, too, actually. So I thought that probably there would be intact deposits because the structure itself looked like, you know, a historic structure with the horizontal clapboards. How old is it? Um, you know, my house was built in 1892, 1892-93, and I don't know if the structure is quite that old, but it's probably close. The structure is not shown on the 1900 Sanborn fire insurance map, but it looks like most of the privies in Lafayette are not shown on the map, so it's really hard to tell exactly how old the structure is. But, you know, it has the features of an old building, so I figured it was, oops, it was probably the original building. It was probably in the same spot. Um, someone, who knows when, maybe 1950s, 1960s, had poured a concrete floor, and so probably whatever's under there was protected. But rather than just ripping everything up, I thought I would do a shovel test, which archaeologists do to kind of test to see what's under the ground surface. And so that's what I did on the left-hand side. And you can kind of see it just at the very bottom of the hole. You can see, um, well, I can't see it here. It's kind of like right here, there's a really dark band. And, and that told me, as soon as I put my shovel through the hard clay that's at the top and I came upon this really loose black sediment with linoleum and some other artifacts in it, I knew that there were intact archaeological deposits. So at that point, I stopped, and then I laid out a three-foot by three-foot excavation unit, which is what you see on the right. Usually archaeologists work in meters, so usually we would do a one meter by one meter test unit, but because the outhouse was a one, one by one would have been kind of just not the right size. This way, it was the right size for me to walk around the edge if I needed to, but I was trying to capture as much of the privy deposits as I could. Um, we set them up so it's exactly square, so you can go horizontally and vertically and maintain kind of the, again, the context of what you're pulling out. And this is to prove that I was actually the one doing it. So <laughs> there was still maybe a foot, foot and a half down that I hadn't excavated yet when this picture was taken. And again, this is just within the structure. I didn't take the structure down. The structure is still up. And it was really important to me to, again, use all the same professional methods that I would use on a, on a job that I'm being paid for. So I borrowed a screen from my former employer, SWCA Environmental Consultants, and this is my one of my dad's cousins screening through one-eighth inch mesh. We screened all the sediments once they were in the cultural deposits, not the clay that was on top, and I'll get back to that in a minute. But we screened all the other sediments through eighth inch mesh so that I could find, I didn't know if I would find maybe beads or buttons or little tiny scraps of whatever, and we ended up recovering like little, probably centimeter diameter pieces of paper that had been burned and, and thrown in there, and some really interesting small things. So it was good that we screened like that. And again, I was say I used to work for SWCA, so I had a couple forms lying around, but I kept track of the, the thickness of each level that I was excavating, and I'll talk about that in a minute too. Um, what came out of it, you know, you number bags and you number artifacts, and then on the right-hand side, it's a picture of the profile. So that's the west wall profile. Um, and again, I'll show you actual photos, but just to demonstrate the lots of paperwork that we unfortunately have to do, which is part of why it's not archaeology isn't as sexy as it appears in the movies. Um, so this is what the privy shaft looked like when I'd finished excavating it. And this is, again, the, also the west wall. So you can see at the top, the red lines are delineating the different strata. So usually we, we use the term stratum to refer to either natural or artificially designated vertical chunks of sediment. Um, a lot of times, so we usually try to use natural strata. For example, like if you next to a river and the river is in certain seasons it's running high and then it slows down and deposits.
deposits a lot of, well, first it deposits rocks if it's running high, I guess, and then when it slows down, it might deposit sand, so you get these layers of um, cobbles and sand, and the, wall, the bank falls in, and then you got darker sediment. So it's the same kind of thing here. As people use the privy, they built up different levels of deposits. A lot of times when people had privies, they would um, throw in ash or from the fireplace or lime to help cut the smell and, and keep the bacteria down. Um, so that's what I was looking for in this case. And here, I kind of have some artificial strata also in that, well, the top part was the concrete. Then the next one down is kind of between the top line and this next line. This was um, sterile, really clay sediment. might have a little bit of ash in it. And a lot of times when they would finish using it outhouse, of course, you don't want to dig all that stuff out. Where would you put it? So you just cap it with sterile sediment so that you don't smell it and then you can build on top of it. And that's what they did here. Then the next stratum was this really, really dark stratum that had a lot of coal in it and charcoal. So it looked like it was kind of a, an unusual type of deposit in here. And I think it was probably from the time that they were using the outhouse, not so much as an outhouse, but as a trash receptacle. Below that um, was fill that I, I couldn't differentiate between different levels in the fill that started here and went all the way down to the bottom. So organic privy fill is what I call that, stratum four. And then this other stratum, five, was um, sterile subsoil. In my backyard, it's like a compact kind of yellowish sandy sediment. Not, not all sand, but maybe sandy loam. And it's really solid. So, um, so I knew that I had gotten down into the sterile sediments when I came upon that. Okay, so we also, of course, analyzed everything that came out of the outhouse, and I relied on some friends of mine that I knew from SWCA, and Bonnie Clark on the very far right is a professor at the University of Denver. She's a historical archaeologist, and um, so she and a couple friends of mine from SWCA and one of my neighbors came over, and we looked at, well, we got together about four different times over pizza and beer and root beer and everything else and looked at all the artifacts. And actually, Bonnie's students, she has four independent study students who are doing more in-depth analyses now on um, the artifacts. So I, I wasn't able to bring the artifacts with me because they're all at DU. Now, why we analyze the artifacts is you can get a ton of information about the people, about the, the you know, kind of natural conditions of the outhouse, what people were doing, who they were, how they were putting trash in there, how often they were doing it, things like that. So we wanted to get at as much information as possible. And some of the things that you can find out is, did people throw the objects in there? I mean, is that how they initially got there? Were they moved from somewhere else? And in this case, there were a few artifacts that suggested that people had burned trash in the yard or somewhere else and then dumped those artifacts into the outhouse. Again, people, because there wasn't a public sewage system or garbage pickup systems, people would burn trash, they would dig holes in their yards to bury the trash. They would use their outhouses as trash receptacles. So that's why outhouses are so rich. Um, and in this case, yeah, there were burned artifacts. And then there were also some artifacts where they refit from about, you know, one piece was here, another piece was a foot down. So that tells us there was some mixing of sediments or maybe someone got in there and kind of moved things around as they were trying to make some more room. Maybe they shoveled a little bit out and the things fell down. There might have been rodents in there that kind of created holes that things dropped down into. So we know that not everything is exactly where it started out, but it looks like from the analyses we did that things pretty much stayed within their levels. And I'll get into that in a little bit too. Now I won't read all of these, but these seven different topics are some of the things that we can learn about by looking at the artifacts. And this, everything that's underneath there just gives you a sense of the kinds of artifacts that we look at, so, or the elements of the, art, of the artifacts. And I'm gonna go through each of these topics for both um, kind of the early period of the outhouse artifacts and then the later period. But before we do that, I want to give you just the basics of Lafayette's history. Lafayette was founded in 1888 by Mary Miller, who owned a big farm, and she carved the original town, which runs from Public Road on the west over to Foot Avenue on the east, and it runs from Baseline Road on the north to Emma Street on the south. So it was on the east side of Public Road. She carved that out of a portion of her farm because uh, one of the Simpson brothers had found coal on her farm, and she knew that that was a, a gold, well, a coal mine, <laughs> a coal mine, and it would bring lots of people to the town. So um, it was interesting because she was quite an you know, upstanding moral person and in the deeds for how 
houses and for lots. She wrote that people couldn't use or sell liquor. Uh, and this was actually true, I've been told, until the 1980s in Lafayette. And I don't have all the details about when different things came to Lafayette, but I do know that by 1896, Lafayette had electric lights, and there were physicians, butchers, and a lot of other people who weren't just coal miners. So it was a really diverse town, even by 1896. And quickly about my house. Uh, my house has been owned by many, many people over the years, but these first five are the important ones that we need to know about for the outhouse, so that I could match artifacts in the outhouse with the people who actually lived in the house. And the house was built by Charles and Minnie Keene, it looks like in 1892 to 93. He bought the lot for Mary Miller in 1892 and took out a couple bank loans, so I assume that that's, that's what he used to build the house. He was not a coal miner. He was something that on the census record says furniture, but it's like abbreviated, so I don't know exactly what that is. But he was young, 24. His wife was English. They had a little daughter. They lived there for a very short period of time. Then they sold it to John and Lita Smith, and John was a preacher who died within five years of moving to the house, but then Lita and her three daughters stayed there for a while longer. Um, 1907, she sold the house to William and Mary Richards, and William Richards was a Welsh coal miner. He had, had he'd been in the English Army. He'd done some pretty important things before he came to Lafayette, and he owned my house the longest, so that's why when I got it landmarked, um, I named it the Richards house. And then he sold it to his grandson, Elmo Lewis, and I don't know that Elmo ever lived there. It's really unclear if he did. He probably maybe rented it out to miners. And then he sold it to Frank and Pearl Todd, and Frank was another miner, but he also died within five years of moving there. So I've never like experienced any ghosts, but it's amazing the number of people who did or deceased as they lived in my house. Okay, so this is kind of a sample of what I found in each level. And all right, this is really basic. Who can tell me? Which level is the oldest? <laughs> yes, all right, very good. Level seven, because the deposits build up. It would have taken a lot longer if there, if I had been able to see different levels down here, but because I just couldn't tell any difference, I just did arbitrary foot thick levels once I got below this dark thing. So I think I dug in in about, you know, maybe eight hours total over two or three days. And having someone else screening for me helped a lot because then I didn't have to climb out and screen and then go back to bed. And then it took a little while longer for the paperwork and drawing profiles and you know. Okay. So again, I'm going to go through those seven different topics and give you examples of how we can interpret the artifacts that come out of an outhouse and any other kind of archaeological site. So, oh, actually I should tell you really quickly. So based on the kinds of artifacts that we found in level seven and six, these absolutely are Victorian levels. So it looks like these probably came from the very beginning of the house, or at least the first few years of the house. Again, the house was built 1892, 1893, and um, seven and six are definitely dating to the 1890s, maybe the very early 1900s. Level five is a little bit harder to distinguish. I mean, presumably it's probably 1910s or something like that. By the time you get to levels 3A and 3B, they're very clearly post-World War I. And level 4 is probably also, you know, 1920, something like that. So, it, so the artifacts, even though there were a few artifacts that, you know, they matched up, they fit together from about a foot apart vertically, or they were burned, and obviously from a different context, they still were consistently getting, going from older up to younger at the top. So we know that no one got in there and like dug everything out and then threw it back in, which is nice. All right, so time period. One way that we could tell that this was Victorian levels was looking at the kinds of bottles, the way the bottles were made. And going from left to right, um, I'll get into that one again in just a second. But the piece on the, the bottle on the left is a three-piece mold bottle. Then there's um, the little one has a hand tool lip. And when you find a bottle where the seam doesn't go all the way up to the very lip of the bottle, you know that that's old. It's like pre-1900 because they used to finish the very lip just with a hand tool. And so it would erase the seams. Um, the molded white porcelain teacup is very typical for a Victorian era. Then there's a two-piece mold. The fact that there are patent medicines, those were really popular in Victorian era. Um, this piece of glass right here is actually lantern glass. So even though Lafayette had electricity in 1896, it didn't mean that everyone was rich enough to have electricity. Um, and I know that late from another artifact that I'll show you in just a minute. This super fancy 
thing that I'll talk about more also is a like a soup tureen, part of a soup tureen, and the fact that it's so garish is also typically Victorian. And then this, it was so cool. We um, went down to Bonnie's lab at DU, and I had she w she'd been picking through the artifacts. We weren't sure what this metal stuff was, all these metal fragments. And, and someone down there said, oh, I know what this is. And she actually had a corset stay. Oh, that's the next one. She had a corset stay in her lab that we could compare this with. So that's what this is right here, the corset stay. It's like one of the ribs that comes out of a corset. And it's metal, which is like the cheapest material, uh, bone being the most expensive. But so these are all very typically Victorian. Can this, I, yeah. Just say sort of a general question. Sure. So when you were down there digging your eight hours, did you find things like in clumps, or was it just constantly something? Constantly something, yeah. There, I mean, there were kind of clumps of things, like the first thing that I found when I put in that shovel test was, like I said, a, like a whole folded up piece of linoleum, and then close to that there were a lot of car parts when I actually got into the excavation unit. It was like a cluster, like there had been a hole and they just dumped four or five car parts and spark plugs and things in there. But in general, it was just constant artifact. Yeah, which, which also makes it hard to distinguish levels, which is why then we go into something that's arbitrary, so at least we can know, well, this came from down here and this came from up here. Now, these two artifacts suggest um, that they may have come from when the house was first being built. Again, these are Victorian levels, some of the lowest levels. And it's a piece of linoleum, and linoleum is surprisingly old. I can't remember when it was invented, like late 1800s or mid 1800s. So that could have been when they were first putting in the floor, they had an extra piece. And the thing on the right, we tested in a um, machine that Bonnie has that tells you what the different elements are in it. And it's brass, zinc, and copper, and then a lot of other things. And she was thinking that it could actually be the very edge piece that they trimmed off if they had installed a sink. So this would be like a sink liner. Um, yeah, so this could have been from construction of the house left over. Again, the different things that tell you if, we didn't, if I didn't know anything at all about the owners of the house, we would still know that there was an adult woman and a, probably an adult man living in the house in this early period. So there's the picture of the corset stay that Bonnie had in her lab. And this actually had the same kinds of hooks. You can't really see from this picture, but like there's a little hook element. Um, and there were, you could see little, actually I think we could see the rivets in the middle there. And then over on the right, those are identical products. It's Mayer's Walnut Oil from Kansas City, Missouri. And originally it was marketed as a hair dye for men. Then it was later marketed as a hair restorative. So someone's grabbing, uh, what do you call it? Grabbing at straws or whatever, but anyway. So from artifacts you can tell genders and ages. You can also look at diet and health. Um, and the, it was really interesting to compare the Victorian levels with the post-World War I levels for diet and health. On the left, you see that there was really a lot of different kinds of edible materials in the, in the privy. So this, to us, looked like some kind of a citrus peel, you know, which is pretty unusual. It's really interesting. Then there's a huge peach pit. Um, I mean, this is bigger than, way bigger than the peaches I get on my tree now, like a big pumpkin pit. These are some kind of squash, one or two different kinds of squashes. This is a fish vertebra. These are butchered cow bones. So really kind of a varied diet. And we know people had written about how rich Mary Miller's farm was. She had all these orchards and grape vines and animals, and it was like nirvana. Um, and so that would make sense that there's a lot of produce that people are growing early on. And the fact that there are butchered animal bones suggests that, again, people had at least enough income that they could go to the butcher, there was a professional butcher, and they could buy their bones. Now, if you went to a rural area, maybe like Appalachia, you'd probably, or, you know, early Appalachia, you'd probably see non-butchered bones, you'd see wild-caught um, fish and game, venison, and things like that. Then over on the right, the interesting thing is, even with this varied diet, you see a lot of patent medicines. But as I said, patent medicines were really in vogue in Victorian times. It was like they would treat everything with alcohol and drugs, and it was just very commonplace. They didn't really know much better. But in addition to these, you know, there's a white powder, there's um, bottles that undoubtedly contain some kinds of um, more, you know, like morphine, um, opiates, things like that. And then there were also calf foot bones. And what we found was that calf foot bones used to be used to make like a jelly. And you would feed this to people who were in poor health and maybe couldn't digest solid food. And so for me, it's really interesting to think about, you know, potentially the, for the young couple, but probably more likely the preacher and his wife, where he died within 
five years of moving there, if he was ailing and this was self-medication for him, you know, that's a really kind of interesting tie-in between the people and the artifacts. We can also look at economic status. Um, I already mentioned that with the butchered animal bones, but here we can see three different kinds of buttons. The mother of pearl being the most expensive, so maybe for like Sunday dress or some, some kind of you know, more expensive dress. Then there's also wood and then metal. And metal was the cheapest, um, you know, could have been working clothes. You also see the soup tureen, which is pretty darn fancy. And Bonnie feels like it probably ma was made in Germany. Unfortunately, there's no maker mark that was, that was left because not all the soup tureen was in the cow house. Um, but just the style, and it's, it's really crazy. It's like airbrushed and decaled and the gold leaf on the edges. So it was probably an heirloom. And, you know, whether it came with the young woman, the English woman, or whether it was given to or, or came with the preacher because he had a little bit higher status, we don't really know. We can also look at the ceramics, and this is a piece of ironstone. So I think there was a little bit of porcelain. Well, I can't remember, but ironstone is kind of a an intermediate ceramic, so it's not the poor person's whiteware that all your dishes would be made of. And, oh, and it's not, well this is porcelain I guess. And it's not porcelain, but it's still a pretty high quality plate. Um, again, I already mentioned the animal bones. Then this was really interesting, so remember Mary Miller didn't like liquor, I, I don't think she liked gambling either, but here are some poker chips that I found, and it was actually, I don't remember the number, but at least 20, at least 20 whole and or fragmentary poker chips. And then over on the right, we're not totally sure, but those felt pads match the size of some of the keys, like on a saxophone. You know, the, the keys that press down and, and close up the holes. So it looks to me like they might have been from a musical instrument. And we know that there were, you know, there were bands in Lafayette and there were singing groups and stuff. So that would be consistent. What were the chips made of? Um, you know, it's, I don't know exactly. It's kind of like, like a, Plastery, kind of plasticky. I mean, plastics came in early too, but I think these they're they're really friable, and it's hard to tell. It's like a chalky kind of material, but it's disintegrated, so I don't know exactly what it started out as. Okay, then uh, Victorian beliefs. They definitely love to be garish with outsiders and show off, but then in the family, I guess it was a really kind of sacred thing. Everything was pure and white and very kind of humble when you're with your family, but when you're entertaining people, that's when you bring out all your best china and you're very fancy. So this dichotomy between the two is really interesting for the Victorian period. And Bonnie feels like, you know, this that cup is whole. And she said a lot of times if someone died and they had something that was particularly connected with them, that would get thrown away because it was so connected. It was like a personal thing and it was hard. It was too hard to keep it around. So that's her idea potentially about the cup. Again, this could be the preacher's cup. Um, and maybe this level really represents that the second owners of the house. Okay, so that was Victorian era. And now we're jumping up to post-World War I, so that would be, you know, like the very end of the 19-teens and then into the 20s through the 1940s. Here we find still glass bottles, but when you look at the bottles, they were made differently than the Victorian ones. So these are machine-made, and there are Owen scars on the bottoms. It's a certain kind of scar that is from when they would pull it back out of the mold or out of the machine. Um, sanitary cans were used for kind of trying to get them as, well, as sanitary would kind of, like as um, not pure. So you don't get bacteria in the can. So it was like a solder dot on the very top of it. So they could put the food in, sterilize it, and then solder it closed. And those are indicative of this later time period. The automobile parts, and this, um, one of the guys who's on the Lafayette Historic Preservation Board with me, well actually he just went off the board, but he, still, he said that this is from a Model T radiator. It's a radiator cap. It's a very distinctive kind of lumpy, it's this guy over here, sorry. This very lumpy thing. And then a car spark plug. And then this screw cap with the plastic and the cork in there, that's, it's still pretty early, but it's certainly not, certainly not 1800s, it's into the 1900s. So that's how we know, even if we had no idea what was below this or on top of this, we would know that this area is, or that, that this level, these artifacts are post-World War I. And you see the same kinds of things again. So here we've got window glass. Um, you've got, oh, for occupations activities. So window glass, they're remodeling the house a little bit. You got more linoleum, so they're maybe ripping up a floor, putting in a new floor. And this was cool, it has like green and white 
either diamonds or squares, however it was oriented. Um, spark plug and the radiator cap, again, someone's working on a car. And then this one thing, oh, and then that's a paint can, maybe like you know, primer, paint, stain, something like that. And then that's a exterior door lock mechanism. So again, someone's working on the house. Um, then we also see all these tools, and these are handles from different kinds of tools. That one on the right apparently is a super fancy kind of like Swiss Army knife type multifunction tool that Bonnie had never seen before. She said it was really cool. Really. I mean, a really cool example of a unique tool. And then the rubber at the top is looks like someone was making washers out of that because you can see the rubber was cut out into circles. Okay. Again, we can learn about genders and ages, even if I didn't know anything of the, about the people who live there. And so on the left, there's a probably a workman's shirt um, and a pipe stem. And I like to think about those being William Richards. You know, he's an older guy. I can see him like sitting around smoking. He was a miner, so he probably, you know, he's not dressed up nicely every day like maybe the preacher would be. And then here's a cold cream jar. This one actually had some cold cream left in it. There was another jar that was empty. It was missing its lid, but this one has a little bit in there. And then another mother of pearl button. So again, you get kind of a range of, you know, from a work shirt up to a fancy dress maybe that had mother of pearl. But this, as I mentioned before, this was really interesting contrast between the post-World War I diet and health and the Victorian diet and health. So on the left, you can see there were lots of canned foods. You don't see the same variety of citrus and fresh fruits and fish and all that kind of stuff. Now it's pretty much just butchered animal bones and canned goods. Um, and then on the right, there's still some, some uh, patent medicine bottles. The one in the middle, I don't know what that is. It always reminds me of absinthe, but whatever it was, they obviously didn't like it because they threw half of it out, which is surprising. Um, and I guess what's interesting is that, you know, patent medicine really kind of went out with the Victorian era. So people usually stopped using those kinds of things, except in small towns where the pharmacists, they didn't have access to a lot of new bottles. They weren't making their own new bottles, and so they would just recycle bottles or people themselves, if they emptied a bottle, they'd bring the bottle back to the pharmacist and get it refilled with the same thing or something different. So that's why you see still all these patent medicine bottles, even potentially up until the 1940s. Oh, and again, but again, suggesting that people weren't super healthy or they were maintaining these kind of long-standing traditions of self-medicating. Again, for economic status, as I mentioned, you, you see kind of a range from the work shirt up to a, a really nice button. But it looks like it's relatively low. So I would say probably the people who lived in my house earlier in the Victorian era probably had a little bit more, a higher social status, more economic resources than the people who lived there later. And that's consistent with this furnisher, whatever the guy was, and a preacher versus coal miners later on. <coughs> okay, here again, um, evidence for hobbies. And because this car stuff lasted until it was like in the top level, obviously it wasn't. Obviously, someone maintained this car for decades, you know, because Model T's, when did they come in? 1904 or 7 or something? Does anyone know? I have to ask it again. Anyway, so, and this is deposited maybe in the very late 40s, early 50s. The thing on the right, we have never figured out exactly what it is, but it's like a hard, it looks kind of like rubber, and so potentially it could be the inside of a homemade ball. And this is the only thing I've ever seen in the outhouse that looks even remotely like it belonged to a child. Even though there were the three, you know, the one-year-old baby, the three girls, and then, oh, I guess that was probably, yeah, that was probably it. So that's probably why we don't see evidence for children's toys or clothes or things like that. This was interesting. It was a, it's a religious medallion. It's made of some kind of cuprous metal, you know, with copper in it. Um, it's small, as you can see, and it's written on in German. And essentially, I, it's very hard to read. I need to get it under a microscope. It's really hard to read everything. But part of it says, you know, pray for us. I think it's a picture of Christ with his hands like this. But no one in the house was German. You know, they were Welsh and English and American of whatever descent. So it's interesting that this medallion shows up that's German. Um, for a variety of reasons, I like to think that potentially my house was kind of a meeting place for some of the coal miners. In 1929, Powers Hapgood, who was a relatively famous union labor organizer, and his wife, uh, Mary, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm blanking, I had it earlier, what's her name, 
Anyway, his wife, who was the first woman to run for governor of Massachusetts, they rented half the house from William Richards because by that time his wife had died. And so they were out here. They were friends with Josephine Roach, who, of course, by that time owned the Rocky Mountain Fuel Company. Um, and it's they claimed there was a newspaper article, which is where I got that early picture of my house from. It's from 1929. And they claimed that they were just here to be miners. They were just here to hang out with the folks. But probably there was some kind of ulterior motive. And so I like to think that maybe my house was kind of a meeting place for miners as they talked about different issues. And that's why you would get a German religious medallion in my outhouse <coughs> when no one who lived, who lived there was German. OK, so the reality that's really interesting about excavating an outhouse in particular is that people, well, a lot of times people would throw secret things into outhouses because who's obviously going to go fishing around in your privy <laughs> to find what you've thrown in there? It was a convenient place for trash, but it was also a great place to hide things if you didn't want other people to see. And so that's why I think we get so many of the medicine bottles, the syringe, some of the secretive things. And in this case, as I mentioned before, Mary Miller was very about moral. She didn't want people drinking and gambling and prostituting and all that kind of stuff. But yet the reality in Lafayette was people were doing all those things, you know, not surprisingly. And you can see the left-hand picture shows some of the patent medicine bottles, um, liquor bottles, the one in the center on the right and the back are liquor bottles, you know, the syringe and the, the white powder, um, and then the gambling. So archaeology is really important because history, a lot of times, you can have as much documentation as you want, but if people chose not to write about some of the more unsavory things, you never know about them. And that's where archaeology can come in and give you the reality behind what people are showing to the outside world. So some final thoughts is that Lafayette, like a lot of these Front Range towns, it's really interesting. It has such a rich history made up of people from all over the place, all different countries, all different walks of life, all different economic levels. And so it's really cool to see all this playing out in my outhouse, in one particular house. Then, as I mentioned before, artifacts, when you take them out of context, when you buy you know, a historic bottle from some guy on the street or buy them from an antique store, yeah, it's a cool bottle, but what do you know? It's so much more interesting to know about who actually used it, why they used it, where it came from, how long they used it. Um, so I really advocate for objects in context, and I try not to buy <coughs> historic artifacts unless I know exactly what their convenience is. Well, even then, I don't <coughs> really buy them. You know, my artifacts aren't for sale. At some point, hopefully, I can donate them to the Lafayette Miners Museum. Um, then, of course, when you have a combination of oral histories or written documentation like census records, assessor's records, and you can combine that with the archaeology, that's when you really know the most because you can do checks and balances on the information. And, and again, please don't go rushing into your backyard and start digging holes. If you're interested um, in doing kind of a, an actual excavation, let me know or talk to someone that you know at a local university because that's, you can learn so much more about it if you do it that way. And unfortunately, I still don't have chickens. One of these years, <laughs> I'm going to get them. Uh, it's just I have too, animal, too many animals right now. I can't leave them all with my neighbors when I go away. So adding six chickens would not be very good. But um, I just want to thank some people who are listed here. And that's, again, that's Bonnie on the left and William and Mary Richards on the right. And I think, oh, yeah, just some sources of information. But thank you. Any questions?